my lecture is kind of based on my influences and motivations to spend every dime on art supplies. I'm going to start with my studio practice. I think it's, this is what I think it is, part scientific lab and a basketball court. <coughs> Reality, it's a sticky mess of silicone. The science lab might seem like a stretch, but it's, my work is experimental. I don't want to know the answers when I start. I want to figure those out through making which means I make a lot of bad messes, a lot of bad art that ends up in a landfill somewhere. But I don't like to let those like defeat me because I think that through those mistakes, um, they actually like provide more information. So they're like data points for me. And science has proved through accidental methods that sometimes we get great things like penicillin. Basketball, my first love. I think that basketball really influenced me in my studio practice. But lucky for the art world, we had a breakup. Um, I had some issues with some size requirements. Um, I know that sports can be this dirty word, especially in the art world. But there's actually a lot of connections. So there's rigor going to practice all the time, doing the same thing over and over. There's also a lot of dedication that's kind of weird and sometimes I feel like it's a little stupid to give all my time and money and energy to something that sometimes feels like unreachable. And athletes do the same thing. There's like this dream within an athlete and an artist um, that moves you, that makes you go when you're tired. It's something that seems out of reach even still, but it's like worth reaching for. Sports and art are a really big part of culture. They're a part of our history. Oh yeah, art used to be in the Olympics. And there's actually a lot of connections. One is emotion, what I feel. Um, and if you ever watch a game, like a big World Series game or a championship, the winning team is crying, so is the losing team. They also take focus. But basketball in particular, in my opinion, I'm a little biased, but I think that it has design, it has style, it has finesse alongside the strength. And sometimes when I get defeated or feel like I didn't get the opportunity I wanted, I remember that Michael Jordan, the second best player who ever played the game, got cut from his high school varsity team. And he made it later, um, so when I think about that, I think that my opportunities will come later. This is the number one player. LeBron is king. Okay, so a lot of artists get inspiration from nature, beauty, the human form, literature, politics. And a lot of my inspiration comes from influences and life experiences and places I least expect. Here we have Ian Fisher, a painter in Denver the clouds, and then this is a piece by Irene McRae, who's one of our favorites here at RIMCAD. I find a lot of inspiration from doing dirty town tours, going to dive bars and pool halls. I'm gonna do a quick flashback um, to some work I did in grad school. I went to Cheyenne, Wyoming on spring break. I don't like to ski, and the mountains are kind of boring. And I was also broke, so that was an easy way to go up north. Um, and while I was there, I was really attracted to the dirty alleys, the dive bars, the sad strip club, um, the pool tables with decades of stains. They like moved me, and I didn't really understand at the time. But then I discovered this philosopher, Julia Kristeva, who wrote this book, Powers of Horror, and Essays on Objection. And for me, reading this was really difficult. Um, a lot of words that I had to look up numerous times. However, it gave me the language to describe my infatuation with these sites and spaces. This um, other work up here is Paul McCarthy, and uh, there's a lot of crossover in our interest in our work. So after spring break, I came back and I watched this documentary 
called The Wild and Wonderful Whites of West Virginia. And it basically follows this family. Um, this is Jessica White. He is famous for these like dance moves that are between like tap dancing and I'm not sure what else. I'm not going to try and show you guys. Um, but um, the family is crazy. They're kind of like the back of the woods. They live in Appalachia. Oops. And um, they are famous for the dance moves, but also they're always getting in trouble with the law. And they have drug addictions, poverty issues, and a lot of violence. It's kind of a funny documentary, but also very sad. But I found a connection with the whites from West Virginia to the Cobbs from North St. Louis. And this one family member, um, this is Jessica's niece, Kirk. I was really drawn to her, and what happens, it's sad, but there's a little bit of hope. She loses her daughter, her newborn. She goes to court, goes to rehab, um, and the Wild Whites decide that when she gets out of rehab to go party and do a lot of heavy drinking. And so they go to this bar, and there's this one particular scene where Kirk leaves the dance floor and goes into this like dingy bathroom that's nasty, dark wood paneling. And um, it's very dark in there. And she inhales some cocaine, and her face has this sense of regret. But the scene is so dark, and the, there's just this like light shining on her from the camera, and she has this cheap glitter eyeshadow. And even though this is a dark moment, there was like this sense of hope I saw, and she encompassed that. So I wanted to explore this in some work. So I made a series of installations and sculptures using these dilapidated materials and kind of incorporating that glow and sparkle. I went to rural areas in Colorado, Wyoming, um, to dive bars that opened at 7 a.m. Um, to gather source material as well as physical materials. Fast forward to the future. This is my fierce game face. <laughs> Two years ago, I realized that everything in my life was art. Everything, my free time, my job, my friends. And so I decided I needed to search for the other in my life. So I wanted to do something competitive. And it was either kickboxing or pool. And I like my face. So I went pool, which was fitting because of the dive bars. And I went into pool with a bit, I was a bit naive. I thought that the only thing that separated me from my competitors, which were mostly men, um, was experience, right? Just time. It's not about being big, tall. There's no strength involved. But then I realized that my experience playing was altered by my gender. And I kind of felt like an ass for not thinking that that would happen. And so this piece is actually a small model right now, but I'm going to make it into a future sculpture. So I don't know if I'm like trying to beat the horse's ass or if I am the horse's ass. Um, I don't really care. It's just a way to think about that situation. So the way that the players treated me at times messed with my game in my head. And you know, it's just like the basic sexual harassment, unwanted flirtations, sexism. Um, and over time, just playing and like trying to learn the game, I realized a lot of the terminology had to do with sexuality uh, and also like digs at the female body. So I decided that I need to do some research. And so I go through a bunch of uh, terminology, both official and unofficial, and just start learning definitions and um, created this little map for my sketchbook. Um, and these are kind of starting points for me uh, to like think about a piece um, or a title of a work. I actually want Felts in the Middle. I want that to be my next solo exhibition title. I realized that this experience needs to like unfold in my work. And there's this artist, Louise Bourgeois, who's like one of my favorites. 
she has this work, um, and it's just the title, What is the Shape of This Problem? It's not really about this particular piece. It's really about the idea that I can like, figure out things with form and color, and different materials and scale, so that I can navigate these situations that I feel complicated. So we begin to research the history of the pool, the best players, the geometry, the symmetry. And then I started gathering images of female pool players. And I find this image of this young girl on the left there. And I was like, wow, that kind of looks like me. And I um, started to research this player and found out that she was like a child prodigy. She was really competitive. She played with both men and women. She's ranked 15 out of the 50 best pole players of the 20th century. She was also a person that rebelled against the dress code. And so at a time, women were expected to wear like skirts or dresses, which is crazy. It's pole. But that angered me, and I wanted to research these reasons. And I found out it wasn't just men that wanted that. It was the women, too. So they wanted to make it more attractive. So I take a bit of a segue from the pool and I start researching these other issues with female uniforms. And tennis is definitely one that still talked about today. Badminton and the other. And they wanted uh, women to be more attractive, right? To look less athletic, both the men and women. Over time, then the women became too attractive or too sexy, and then they're criticized for that. So I get this book on sexual sports rhetoric. Um, and there's a chapter on bodybuilding. And I discovered that the female bodybuilders, I mean, there's a swimsuit competition, but it has to be a bikini. And they also have to wear high heels. And it was because they thought that the women didn't look natural because they were so muscular, which is really funny when you look at them side by side because they both look unnatural. <laughs> Another unexpected element that came up with pool was the conflicting relationship I have with masculinity, which is a dirty word today. Um, there's definitely a lot of underlying issues that should be examined, but there's like this conflict that I feel and a contradiction because I love and adore masculinity. I find myself attracted to it, but I'm also like threatened by it and afraid of it. So it's like this ongoing love and hate relationship, just like I had with abjection. There's a repulsion and an attraction. Another thing that came up is that I had this empathy for masculinity. So I love winning. I'm super competitive. I want to beat everyone. And I had this joy of beating like six foot three biker gym. And wanting to do it over and over. And I liked that I proved them wrong, but also I would see how his friends would react. Um, I would see the devastation when he lost to like a small female. And I would feel torn and like sometimes want to lose a game because I didn't want to deal with that part of it. And so that's that conflict I'm trying to figure out. And I'm trying to figure out how to like, I unravel these I'm not sure how it's going to end up. All of those last images are just some experiments I've done in the studio. And I don't know what's going to happen. Um, I just want to like open up the dialogue with myself and try to understand those contradictions I feel. And you know, hopefully others will talk with me at some point. I'm going to leave you guys with this amazing artwork. Thank you. Today I'm going to explain to you a little bit about my journey or share some stories about my journey, how I um, have become more involved in the area of product development coming from you know, just a general love of art. And so um, you can see I'm very involved with my uh, community. Um, Art Licensing Show is a website that I developed where we have uh, members from all over the world that are focused on licensing artwork and 
you know, creating beautiful things to share with the world. If you've ever been to a shopping center or bought a greeting card for your mother, you have bought some of their work. So, so this is my, this is Lady Guinevere, we call her Gwynny, and Benjamin, um, we were at the, the Mecca for illustration there in New York, Society of Illustrators, and I also help him out with 3D chalk art. We go all over the country and we create 3D illusions with uh, chalk on the street. So this is a quote that I've always loved. Um, this, Anne Frank is just such a, an amazing inspiration to me. This the idea that you know, no matter how hard things get, and things get very hard. Um, Ben's a two-time liver transplant recipient, and we live with life and death situations on a regular basis, unfortunately. But um, it's always been my honor to be a part of making the world a more beautiful place. So this is me as a little girl, and I grew up out on the a high prairie in a log home with a wood-burning fireplace and um, kind of a little, little house on the prairie. <laughs> um, but when I, when I was about that old, uh, two or three, my mom uh, went to the cupboard one day and discovered all of the cans had no labels on them. Apparently, I had taken them all off, and I was studying them, and I was uh, really researching how <laughs> to recreate these labels with my little crayons. And so I, it was a, just an early example of my passion for design and art and branding. And, and uh, when I was, I don't know, about five or six, I, that's when I started my, my little, I played gift shop, you know, we played school, we played a lot of things with the kids, but I was the oldest of, we had six kids um, my parents actually uh, took on uh, adopting special needs children with many different kinds of disabilities, um, from you know cerebral palsy to autism to you know quadriplegic. So we had a, and we had a very diverse family from different nationalities. So it was kind of cool. Um, I think there was 13 of us all together by the time you count them all, um, and four of us biological kids. So I had a lot of wonderful experiences teaching them art growing up. But um, making things with my hands, something that I just feel like we all have gifts that we have been given and seeds that, are, um, that God has placed in our heart. And I am really excited to start to see some of these seeds that I've had as a small child start to burst forth, teaching obviously one of them, but um, creating as well. So this is some of my work that I did when I was a student here at RIMCAD. I loved oil painting, but even before I got into oil painting, I was always uh, interested in watercolor. And uh, when I was 16, I had the, the two awesome things happen. I got the opportunity to go to, uh, uh, I started some art college uh, art classes basically at, uh, sorry, Colorado University, and that was really a cool way to enter the, the world of art from a professional standpoint. And, also, you know, it was, a, it was a birthplace of the G-clay printing, and a lot of new uh, technology was starting to come about with the internet. And I was kind of being able to learn about that on the forefront. And then the other thing that happened when I was 16 is I got to go to Russia, which was an amazing experience working with uh, spe special needs uh, orphans there um, that were recovering from tuberculosis. And when we were there, we also had the opportunity to check out some local cultural things, such as the ballet the, uh, and the, um, the Moscow uh, Circus, which is a very narrative uh, storytelling kind of circus. And we also were able to check out like the Fabergé eggs at the Kremlin. And, and um, Rost, Rostov is a really cool um, place where they actually still hand paint enamel jewelry. And they've been doing that since the 18th century. So, being able to see how they, you know, make the stacking dolls, the stacking Russian dolls, and how they have been able to create all these amazing, beautiful things by hand, um, seeing the artists on the in the countryside painting, it this has left this huge impression on me, and in uh, the process of creating artwork and artwork that can be enjoyed as well. So. Um, this was um, my first publication when I was in school. I was um, asked to be a part of this book on color, and these were, this was the digital painting section, so it was a brand new, um, brand new medium, basically, so it was kind of exciting. 
So when I was in, uh, at CCU, I also was the editor for the Paragon, and that was a really fun little creative literary, literary arts magazine. And when I graduated, well, it was right after 9-11, so it was a little bit tricky around then, and if you guys, um, you know, if you've seen the economy go up and down and wonder what's going to happen, um, you know, after I graduated, there were almost no jobs. <laughs> Even though I had experience, I even had a work-study experience working as a graphic designer and had done a lot of freelance for magazines and, and different um, local nonprofits, there wasn't really a lot out there. So um, one thing that I was very intent on doing is staying networked with my local artists community. So people that had graduated with me, we, we formed a little coalition called Illustrators Anonymous and got together like once a week to have coffee and just talk about whatever. And so an interesting thing happened. One of my friends who I kind of, we had like one class together early on, he said he was leaving his job. And he asked if I would go and interview as a replacement. So I thought, well, okay, well, I don't even know what you do. <laughs> but sure, I mean, I would love a job, right? So I interviewed with this woman. It was late on a Thursday night. And just not a typical interview situation, but um, I went in, got the job, and the next morning I started with um, Clint Eastwood, it's a golf apparel company, and I was designing clothing, basically. I was designing um, all kinds of things for the sports of golf. So this is Nancy Haley. She was our CEO, and she also was an Ernst & Young winner. And the week I started, actually, they were featured both in the Denver Post lifestyle section and on Good Morning America. So I knew I had landed a great job. <laughs> so this is some of the things I did while I was there. Um, we created a lot of branding for Clint um, billboards. We did special uh, lines. This is like a wind skin, um, kind of an athletic line. And then lots and lots of polo shirts, lots of stripes and lots of wonderful color. And this, these are all hand lettering. And I included all of these because I learned so much about printing during all these projects I'm showing you. I just going to the, uh, the factories and the printing um, presses while, while they're running all these catalogs and making sure every color is going to hit just right on. Um, organizing models for photo shoots, color correcting each and every um, image, that, you know, thousands and thousands of SKUs that we worked on. And um, just, there's all the relationships. Um, you can see in here, that's Dina, that's Clint's wife in the middle, in the blue. And this was one piece I was really proud of because it was my very first um, apparel item that I designed myself. So actually, all of these things, so the bag, the hat, and the and the little um, shirt there, but I did the embroidery around the neckline, which was really fun. And then all of those, they're called CADs, all of those are hand illustrated. And this piece was really cool because it, um, if you were to print this today, you would do it digitally, but this was done traditionally and there's like 18 line screens <laughs> on this piece. It, it's an amazing, immaculate um, piece of work actually and um, some other tote bags and apparel items that I designed. And we ended up going into doing hats and belts and purses and shoes by the time that I decided to leave. This was a line that, um, that we did a collaboration with a couple of us artists um, just to add some more fun to the, the golf line. And then, we did, you know, if you do a really good job, people want to kind of be part of this. So Izod came um, to us and we actually ended up becoming a licensee of IZOD and created this brand IZOD G. And I was basically very, um, a huge part of creating this launch. We worked on a lot of fun events, as you can see, like the Black Crows and Alice Cooper and Huey Lewis and the News and lots of fun things. We um, also had a Super Bowl um, ad that I got to be a part of, which is it's not something you get to do every day. So this is a point of purchase display that I des helped design. And, you know, these are really great for retail. So learning a lot about point of purchase and, and uh, all the different things that go on in retail 
from the developer side was really exciting, and, and also the sales reps and getting them prepped. So I decided to leave um, and go out on my own. My husband and I, my focus in, in school was children's books, so I actually I wanted to go ahead and focus on that full time. And of course, <laughs> you, you, my, the timing is beautiful, you guys. So I, I left um, 2007, 2008 when I did my first launch, then the market crashed again. <laughs> so, and, and also, sadly, I was in a really bad car accident. So um, things didn't go out the way, the way I planned, but everything worked out great. Actually, that's about 10 years ago, I started teaching here at RimCat, and I've loved every minute of working with all of you wonderful students. Um, we also had a greeting, greeting card company called Painting for Life. We did for about eight years solid, um, and we still are looking at doing other things with that too. So exploring different things besides children's books, lots and lots of websites, branding for clients, and just lots and lots of <laughs> clients. Um, and then recently I've been traveling a lot, and. Uh, this, this is a trip, trip I took to Demdeco, and I've been really inspired by um, some abstract artists like this one, Ma Makoto Fujimura, and he's just a world-class Japanese um, il uh, artist. And Demdeco does a lot of gift uh, industry leadership. And then recently also going to Hallmark um, Leaning Tree here in, in Colorado, and down to Waco, Texas, to the Magnolia has been really influential in learning about product development. Also licensing. So I've been all over Las Vegas uh, to learn about how licensing works on the big scale. Um, I have started exhibiting my own work in, in Anaheim, and then New York and Chicago, getting opportunities to start actually working with companies developing product, and obviously continue to network with this wonderful, or, or just many organizations um, that are part of this world. So this is what I'm focusing on right now. Um, my brand is called Something to Cherish, and it is all about empowering women to live their most divinely cherished lives, body, soul, mind, and spirit, because life is a gift. And this is just a little bit of my you know, artwork that you can see and some product mock-ups. Everything starts with a sketch, as you know. Everything starts with an idea. And I've just found through the traveling that I've been doing recently, my mind has like caught on fire as I'm learning all the intricacies of product development and realizing that seed that has been in me all this time is now ready to really burst forth. This is a little overview of some of the tenets of my brand. It's my sister. <laughs> and, you know, you've got to always think about who is buying your, your artwork. So this is a little bit about my, my demographic, which is really cool because they say it's like 8 to 88 because it really appeals, appeals to a very large demographic. And I'm just going to go through some of these slides. Positive messaging is a really huge core to what I'm all about. If you know me, um, I'm always looking to encourage and uplift and bring positivity to any situation. And giving back. So, you know, designating a certain percentage of certain projects or whatever we're doing to help people that are suffering. Because, you know, growing up with the family that I grew up in, you just, you cannot disregard the, the fact that people are out there that are um, needing, needing help. And then cherishing our earth. So, you know, every time I go to design something, and I challenge you guys to do this too, think about where it's coming from, the materials you're using, and where they're, they're going. And since um, fashion is such a huge piece of the earth, you know, the, the um, in, impact on the earth right now, we really do need to think about these things. And more mock-ups. And I've been doing some wall art for different companies. And this is um, basically what I, the, the beginning of a project that's coming to launch next January. It's called Elements by Cherish, and it's inspired by the Earth. So, you know, Earth the, um, and the cosmos and fire and wind and air and water. 
And these are some tech, uh, technical drawings. There's other more technical drawings I won't show you. <laughs> but these are some prototypes that I just got back, some journals. We have trinket dishes, scarves, handbags. So it's really exciting to see all these products coming together. And um, this, so this is my inspiration board on, on the left. And you can see this is the final prototype that I'm wearing um, on the right. So anyway, so that's all I have. Thank you so much for um, letting me share this with you. And if you remember the um, format to you slightly. <laughs>